lots and lots of demand on the physical side. Although ETFs and ETCs have been selling off gold and silver in on, uh, as of late, as of February, actually. I haven't seen the March numbers. So we invited a, a special guest onto the program to help us shed some light on how the physical side, the bullion side, is developing for gold and silver. And uh, I'm joined by Mark Yaxley. Mark, it's great to see you and uh, looking forward to your insights. Hi, good to be here. Looking forward to sharing those with you. Oh, absolutely. Um, Mark, it's your first time on SOAR Financially. I'm really glad you could make it. Can you quickly introduce yourself before we jump into the overall discussion here? Sure. I'm Managing Director and Co-Founder of Strategic Wealth Preservation. A lot of people know us as SWP at this point. And basically, we do two things. We sell gold and silver, physical uh, gold and silver, and we also store that physical gold and silver on behalf of our clients. And we do that in uh, 10 locations worldwide. So we offer secure storage facilities in North America, in the Caribbean, in Europe, and in Asia as well. Uh, so for precious metal investors that are looking to diversify their holdings uh, within our global network, that's basically how we spend our days is helping those people out. Not fantastic. I've seen interviews of you standing in the gold vault or in the vault in general. Always quite impressive, right? <laughs> Yeah, I've spent, I've spent a fair amount of time inside of uh, of gold and silver vaults. I actually, you know, always enjoy being there. You know, it's 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 great to do the office work, but the fun is actually inside the vault when you get to uh, to hold these products, of course. Ever get gold fever yourself? Definitely. I mean, I've had gold fever. I've been in the industry now for 17 years. Uh, it took me a few years to really understand the true value and inherent value and, and purpose of owning gold and silver, but it's you know, it's it's definitely stuck with me as an investor, as a private person. Uh, I've learned that lesson and seen some very good examples of why uh, anyone should hold gold and silver. Oh, absolutely. Just just as of late, we've been reminded again why it's a good idea to do that, right? Um, exactly. Mark, let's, let's change gears a little bit because uh, lots going on in the world. And uh, I've recently come across some numbers um, on the ETF and ETC side. And I've seen that the physical, like up until February before, you know, things start to unfold on the banking side, they've been selling off uh, physical gold by quite a bit. Overall, I think it was close to a billion dollars, which is a big, big number. Um, how have things developed in, in recent weeks and months here, Mark, on the physical side? Yeah, you're absolutely right. We've seen a general trend of uh, the ETFs, at least in North America, which is a market I follow most closely. We've seen a general trend of, uh, of exodus from the ETFs. Uh, we haven't, as you said, seen the March numbers yet published. Um, but it's interesting because on the physical side, which represents a different segment of the market, you, you can think of the ETFs representing, you know, the Wall Street segment, the institutional buyers, um, certainly investors who are not interested in holding physical uh, gold and silver. Um, you know, there, there's been a net exodus, as we pointed out. But on the physical side, we've actually seen very, very strong demand. Really starting in uh, January of 2023 uh, and, and up until today uh, that we're speaking, the demand has been very strong with, with the exception of a few weeks in February. And that's when we saw that the prices of gold and silver dip. You know, gold was down about 18, 15 US dollars at the time. Uh, and since then has rallied, uh, made a very strong rally. So I would expect to see the, uh, the ETF numbers recover in March. That's my expectation. But uh, on the physical side, it is, I, I was saying to colleagues and to clients recently, it's as busy as it was at the beginning of COVID back in uh, February 2020, when we saw just a, a strong rally on gold and a lot of demand for physical metal. It's, it's resembled that the last few weeks with the banking uh, turmoil that we found ourselves in. Oh, wow. So you're, you're saying similar levels, so similar volumes of uh, you know, physical moved? That's, uh, that, that's impressive. It is. It doesn't happen very often. I mean, we went uh, after the last financial crisis in 2008 through 2012, we went through a period of about seven years where gold and silver were relatively flat trading sideways, no outbursts of, of strong demand, not for any particular length of time. And in the last three years, we've we've seen several, you know, you've had you had COVID, then you had the war breakout. And now you've had this banking turmoil, which I don't think is done because that ties into interest rates. There's so much at play right now. So uh, I think, you know, you mentioned earlier, gold kind of proving it, it's, it's, its use case. I was saying this morning to a colleague, uh, if you're looking for, for, for reasons, fundamental reasons why you should own gold, I think we've had real life examples over the last three years uh, as to why you should own gold and the performance of gold during those crisis periods. So very interesting times and, and certainly a lot of demand on the physical side. That's interesting that you're saying that because the gold price ran quite a bit and, uh, you know, 
you probably or the investors bought gold as a safe haven because when you see price rallies like that usually the physical demand slows down right uh gold has moved four hundred dollars um what, what is sort of the feedback you're getting from your investors or you know people you're speaking to like why are they specifically buying gold like what's their like is there a reason like if you just just elaborate that it's like i'm guessing the answer here but uh just just elaborate on that for a second well, the, the 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 probably the more important trend for for North American investors. Again, these are the people that we speak to, so I'm most familiar with them um, and their behaviors and and their ways. Would be the expectation of lack of performance in the stock market. So you know, it, Americans love buying shares; they love buying equities. And the general consensus is is that the stock market is either going to trade sideways or slightly down in 2023, perhaps into 2024. And therefore, they're looking at alternative investments. You know, you, you've seen a little bit of a rally in Bitcoin even uh, at the same time as well. But certainly some of that money is it has sought, sought shelter in gold or sought some returns in silver, for example, because silver is, is quite a good trade in a bull market uh, for precious metals. So some of that's the underlying trend. And then I think you compound that with more recent events where you have basically fear entering uh, the psychology of the investor, which would be more recently, the banking turmoil. Obviously, you have the war that continues. You have tensions between the U.S. and China, which are escalating. You know, just yesterday, I believe, uh, Taiwanese representatives landed on American soil for an important meeting with the Biden administration. That's the kind of stuff that just puts fear in people in general. But obviously, we always look at the U.S. dollar. Uh, it it uh, the strength of the U.S. dollar has been one thing that's been weighing on gold, and it does remain. Uh, in, in its upper range uh, of its historical strength. I do think, and I've been saying for a long time now, I think the trend for the US dollar to to continue weakening is there. It's it's already begun that. It's come down, you know, somewhere between six to eight percent over the last few months in terms of uh of its strength historical sorry, in terms of its historical median. So I think that trend will continue, which will be positive for gold. I think the table is really nicely set for gold and silver right now. It's kind of consolidated here towards the end of March. Uh, but uh, I don't think this rally is done. And I don't think the banking turmoil is, is is done either. Although a lot of people are optimistic that it is. I don't know. I'm curious if it's just a storm in the water glass here on the banking side. But uh, that's a whole different conversation. Uh, Mark, you have some insights like on the physical side. I'm really curious, like who has been buying, like in, in terms of like um, democ uh, demographics here. Is it the retail buyer? Is it the high net worth investor, the, the family office? Um, on, on the physical side, like where are you seeing the most demand from, or is it all over the place? Well, I mean, our business caters mostly to private individuals. So certainly we're a little bit skewed in that sense. We we do cater to kind of mid to high net worth private individuals. So we are seeing buying from them. These are generally people that are a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of uh, reallocating assets within their investment portfolios versus, you know, the main street, you know, mom and pop investors who are usually quite late uh, to the party, they'll start investing in gold when it's reached its all time highs or very near all time highs, because it's now front page news. So I'd say we're still in the earlier phases, if this is a true bull market, and this market continues, and gold rallies over 2000 US dollars, for example, I don't think that we've seen the majority of investors show up to the party just quite yet. Obviously, we talked about the ETFs. We saw outflows over, over several months in late 2022 and early 2023. But the central banks, the other segment, so if you have your physical buyers, you have the ETF buyers, and then you have the central banks. Central bank demand has remained strong. It is concentrated amongst you know a, a limited number of countries. But I think that reflects general... Um, uh, you know, the general sense of the world today is, is you know, we can we can throw mud at central banks all we like. We can call the, you know, these, these, these guys evil bankers and we can hate on our governments all we like. But the truth is central banks tend to employ some pretty smart people. And if they're buying large positions of gold to strengthen their economies and strengthen their negotiating positions at the, at the, the global level, you know, there's good reason for that. And, and investors should at least take note of that. And I think that certainly... As I said, some investors here in North America are, and I, I know that's the case in Germany as well. I mean, I still keep an eye on, on German news and know that the Germans are wise enough to, to still be lining up at the Gusa and buying their, <laughs> their gold as well. Oh, absolutely. We've been, we're burnt children, right? So we definitely touched the hot stove more than once. So 
in, in, in that regard. Um, you, you brought up the global spectrum and you have offices and vaults all over the globe. So I'm kind of curious as well, geographically, like where the interest is mostly like coming from as well. You brought up central banks, because if you look at the, the biggest buyer on the central bank side, it's more the eastern countries, meaning like mm -hmm. China, Russia, um, and the and some of the stands as well, buying quite a bit of gold. Um, so curious if that's something you track on the retail side as well, um, if, if it's more shifting to the east. Yeah, I mean, Europeans in general are, are, are known, I mean, Germans per capita buy the most gold in the world. A lot of people think it's Chinese or Indians because they have this rich culture, this rich gold culture. But when you break it down per capita, Germans actually buy the most gold. Obviously, you're always going to see consistent gold buying in, in Eastern cultures because it's very deeply ingrained. Um, but I mean, I guess the question is more that what I can comment on is where people are putting their gold. Where is the gold flowing to? You know, it's purchased. It can be purchased from us, a company based in the Cayman Islands. But where is it being positioned? I can tell you where it's not. Canada has definitely fallen out of favor with investors in North America. We had the Emergency Act. I, mean, I being Canadian, I say we had the Emergency Act in 2022, which is very unpopular with most uh, Canadians and, and a lot of investors in North America. Canada had been seen as a safe haven for a long, long time. And I think it's lost a little bit of that shine. You had Zurich, which was, you know, uh, a hub for precious metals for, and still is, you know, for for, for decades, centuries, really, the Swiss are, are known as, you know, the, the ultimate uh, stores of, of wealth and gold. Uh, but with the war in Russia, some people are a little bit more nervous about storing their, their assets or storing a lot of precious metals in Zurich. So we've seen a little bit of hesitation there. So that really leaves uh, places like Singapore has become uh, and remains a very uh, strong hub for the flow of precious metals. There's there's a lot of dealers and a lot of vaults that are active in Singapore. And in Cayman, you know, we, we built our vault here because we wanted to cater to the American market and, and give them an option that was closer to home. And we've continued to see a lot of movement more and more offshore, you know, people are uneasy. I don't know what it's like in Germany. Maybe you can comment, but people are uneasy about storing assets in the U.S. The banking system just teetered. So they're even more uneasy than usual because the bank is a safe place. You're supposed to put your money. And now even that's not safe anymore. Uh, and like I said, Canada is no longer considered, uh, you know, an offshore uh, option for Americans. So we're seeing more and more metal flow offshore uh, in general, I would say. No, oh, interesting commentary. Appreciate that. Um, one, one thought I had about the ETFs and the ETCs, like, do you see a substitute effect, meaning investors selling their ETF or ETC holdings and buying physical gold, putting it in a vault with you guys? That's a very good question and not one that I've reflected on tremendously, but I will say this. I spent a few hours on a flight recently reading the terms and conditions of one of the largest ETFs in the United States. I was doing homework for a video that we were going to shoot. And upon reading the terms and conditions of that ETF, uh, I was, even as an industry professional, I was kind of shocked. A lot of the risk was transferred to the custodian, which was a bank. Uh, in this case, it was HSBC Bank. So the ETF itself was no longer holding the risk uh, of the underlying asset, the gold and silver. They were really transferring that risk to the custodian. And if you know anything about banks and what they do with assets, it makes you wonder if they're going to actually you know, allocate the gold and silver the way that the, it's intended to be allocated for those ETFs. So my point being that if you take the time to really look at what an ETF is and how it functions and what your, your risk is as an investor, and I think there are people that do that and they should, then yes, those people will come to say, well, you know what, I might pay a little bit more to go and get my physical gold and silver and put it in a storage facility or take home delivery or whatever they're comfortable with. So to answer your question, yes, I do believe there has been more people and again, that's compounded by the, the issue that we're having with the banks right now, where people are just tired of virtual, you know, the numbers, I've got a bank account, I've got investment accounts, but nothing is real. And when things go sideways, those, those numbers and those decisions happen very, very quickly. You see regulators closing banks on Sundays. You know, most people, they're not reading the news till Monday morning. They had no idea this was even happening. And yet it's happened. And so I think, yes, there are some people that are looking towards alternative assets, especially physical assets, definitely. Yeah, no, I find that interesting as well, like because the ETF, some, some of them charge ridiculous fees as well, right? So it's not even competitive for some of them, not all of them, but some of them are not even competitive in that regard. And you're, as you said, you're not even sure if you get delivery, despite it saying in the contract, okay, you, you will receive physical at some point, or you can receive physical. 
right? You can. And in some cases, it's a minimum of 400 ounces. They'll only send you a 400 ounce gold bar, which is not, you know, it's too large for some people. It's not it, It's not the right format for others. Uh, you're right. The, no. the fees, it's it's a question of, uh, of um, convenience for most people. And they, they believe because of the way that ETFs are marketed, that the cost structure is very, very good. But in fact, when you really crunch the numbers, you probably end up saving a quarter percent or half a percent on your investment, which in my mind is not worthwhile. No, absolutely not. You, well, we, we talked fees, which brings me to premiums. Um, it's been insane. Like I just Googled before our conversation here as well, how much a Silver Eagle goes for. And a number I found was between 37 and 39 US dollars an ounce. And only today we broke $24. Right, so there's what is that? A thirteen dollar minimum markup. That's uh, over fifty percent, right? Uh, yes. So it's an insane markup. Um, so my question for you is: How have premiums developed? I've heard that they have come down, but looking at the numbers, it doesn't seem like it. No, so they did come down. Uh, you know, when we saw the, the 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 slowing in demand in February that we touched on earlier, yes, premiums started to soften a little bit. So premiums are a great. I, I say this all the time. It's a it's a reflection of the best reflection of true demand for physical metal because premiums only go up when there's a lot of demand and they only come down when demand softens. And that's because dealers and wholesalers and distributors can charge more in a hot market and they, they have to be very price competitive to sell, to turn over buoying in a slow market. So they reduce their premiums in a slow market. So when you see a silver Eagle, which by the way, lesson number one, don't buy silver Eagles. <laughs> it's, you're never going to, you're going to have a hard time recovering that much premium. I'm not, you know, I'm not an advocate of, of, of overspending on premiums. You've probably heard me say that before. There are other products, for example, you could go and buy 100 ounce silver bars right now, call it $3 over spot, maybe $275 over spot for, for Royal Canadian Mint product, which is a sovereign mint as well. And, and you've saved yourself $10 an ounce on silver, which is a ton. Um, but long story short, in the last couple of weeks, we have seen premiums increasing from wholesalers and distributors. We've seen multiple increases per day, which is not typical. You might generally get a price adjustment once a week. And right now we we can get be getting one or two a day, which means that you know volume is the volume of demand is very, very high. And therefore the wholesalers and distributors are adjusting upwards as a result. I expect this is going to continue um at these levels and the other thing that investors are going to notice is that delivery times and availability of product is starting to be squeezed i was speaking to a, a large refinery in canada one of the lbma uh, members recently and he said the silver market is extremely tight and that really struck me because we were talking about a large order of silver and he said yeah you might be looking at three to six months for delivery now is a very large order but still three to six months is uh, is a long time to be waiting for physical product no. no, actually, glad you brought that up because uh, one of the questions I just wrote down was the deliveries from the mint, right? During during the silver squeeze period, they just weren't prepared to to, to deliver, but there was enough supply, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they had enough thousand ounce bars or so. They just needed to remint them or re repurpose them. Um, are we looking at a similar situation right now, or like how does it look on the supply side there? You you already gave a hint um, on how mm -hmm. it looks. Yeah, fulfillment times are widening. So they went from anywhere from like, uh, you know, in a, in a slow market, just to give you perspective, in a slow market, fulfillment times are like one to three business days. So you place your order online, you pay for it, you expect your product to ship within one to three days. Right now, I would say realistically, it's probably one to five weeks, depending on the product that you're ordering. And some products, you know, for example, we, we reached out to a supplier to order some uh, 10 ounce gold pamp Swiss bars the other day and they said the earliest that we'll see those is the end of april so that's four weeks out from the supplier which means the 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 retail uh client is going to wait you know six weeks really for the delivery so um yeah i mean that's just another indication again of, of of demand for product but certainly if you are thinking about buying gold and silver and thinking about getting into this market and you want to take home delivery of your product you're probably going to want to think about getting in the queue sooner than later um, because you're likely to wait for your product. And some of your favorite products may not be available um, because they're in the form of thousand ounce bars, which need to be recast into silver maple, silver eagle, so on and so forth. So uh, definitely yeah. similar to what you were describing. Yeah. yeah. Martin, Mark, uh, what, what is the favorite product these days? What uh, What are people buying the most right now? Well, one of the reasons silver eagles are so expensive is because Americans love to buy them. <laughs> so, okay. even at $39 an ounce there are people out there buying up uh, a lot of silver eagles but uh, from from our client base and what we recommend 
we tend to sell a lot of uh, gold bars because they're lower premium products. So whether it be a one ounce bar, a 10 ounce bar, I know in Europe, you would be like 100 grams, 250 grams. Um, we sell a lot of kilo bars as well for any investor that's coming in, you know, a more sizable position because the premiums on those would be like, you know, below 2%, around 2% over spot price, which is still very competitive. And um, so there's always a deal out there. You have to speak <laughs> to your, your, your bullion dealer and make sure, you know, you're lucky in Germany. You guys have a lot of really reputable dealers that will sell products at competitive premiums. Uh, in the States, you, you have a mix of, of honest dealers and you have those that are, that are pushing silver eagles at $40, you know, uh, over the spot price and, or sorry, $40 uh, total price. And they're not doing the investors any favors, but to answer your question, uh, we're selling a lot of gold bars at the moment. Yeah. Um, I remember over listening, over, overhearing in a conversation that, uh, you also deal in, um, PGMs. So I'm curious yeah. what that looks like. Cause that's a product category. I, I rarely look at, uh, I've never really talked much about platinum or palladium, although I'm wearing a palladium wedding ring. Um, so I'm curious, uh, how that's developed is my uh, wedding ring worth more right now. And uh, how is the physical <laughs> side looking right now there, uh, Mark? I would guess that your wedding ring is worth more than what you paid for it because uh, you said palladium. Ring? Yeah, it's palladium. Yeah. So pla yeah, palladium. Obviously, when I started in the business, was trading about four hundred dollars an ounce. I think back in two thousand and six, and then it had a huge rally up into the two thousands. It got as high as almost three thousand dollars an ounce. It may have touched three thousand dollars an ounce. Um, and then the war in Russia broke out. It had a strong rally because Russia controls a lot of platinum and palladium. So. You know, there was expectations that that uh, they were banned from the LBMA deliver, good delivery list. So there was an expectation it would stay high. But the, the, the thing that investors really take away, just if there's like at a macro level, platinum, palladium and rhodium are used almost primarily for, for or 80 percent of it is used for one purpose, which is in catalytic converters, which is these traditional combustion engine vehicles. The catalytic converters used to reduce the amount of toxins released into the environment, which is very important. And a lot of developing nations that didn't have these controls in place, like China and India, now are starting to have these controls in place and people are starting to buy their first cars and so on. So that's where a lot of the metal goes. The issue that we're facing right now is that the global economy is not really expanding right now. It's, it's contracting a little bit. It contracted during covid People are not buying as many cars as they would have had the economy, uh, I guess, been in a better overall global position. So demand for those metals has been a little bit weaker, has not, not returned to its highs. But if we come out of our current turmoil in a better overall situation and developing nations, uh, the economy strength, then, then people will start buying more cars than they are right now. And you'll see those metals rally. They're very small markets, so it doesn't take a lot in order for the price movements to occur. Um, but that's that's when I would expect platinum and palladium to do a little bit better than when we're seeing today is when the, the demand for auto, automobiles is stronger. And then you have the argument of the EV vehicle. How does that weigh on these metals? You know, uh, the, there's, there's a longer debate to be had there. Absolutely. So would you recommend physical palladium or platinum uh, as a store of value as well? Or would you just solely focus on gold and silver? You know, I've always recommended to investors, you know, if you're in precious metals for the long haul and you believe in the fundamental reason stone precious metals and you're content with owning precious metals, you should have gold as your pillar metal. Silver is like your trade because it's more volatile. And then you, you should have five or 10% in the platinum group metals because it gives you exposure to a market that performs differently than gold and silver in general. It has its own... Um, it has its own uh, varied performance depending on what's happening, like we said, in the automobile industry. So it gives you uh, it gives you a better sense of diversity, even amongst the precious metals. So I've always been an advocate of that. But there is a downside to physical rhodium, uh, platinum and palladium is that the premiums are quite high because they don't produce a lot of coins and bars. So the mints may only produce, you know, 2000 palladium maple leaves in a week for the entire global demand, which is tiny. I'm just throwing a number out there. But it's a small, small market. So you're going to pay a high premium up front generally. And then the spread, you know, when you go to sell it, you might get a little bit of a discount on your spot. So the total spread on those products is quite high compared to gold. Uh, it's more comparable to silver. So it's not optimal in that sense. But should you have a little bit in your portfolio, it's not going to hurt you over your lifetime, certainly. Yeah. And the last, last question maybe on that part is like, how about uh, develop price development for collector items like that? Like sort of getting a bit off topic, but that's where my mind went. Because I'm, I'm looking at, uh, you know, the 2014 Vienna Philharmonic or so, 
they're worth more than the 2021, obviously, although it's the same amounts of silver, in my opinion. But uh, mm -hmm. there's a bit of a nostalgic value, of course, included. So I'm curious how the price development there for those collector items is. Yeah, I mean, the advice I've been given, I'm not uh, an expert in collectible coins, but the advice I've been given over my career, and even when I've bought some for myself, is if you're going to buy graded coins or collectible coins, well, first of all, they should be graded. So if, you, if you're going to spend the money, spend them on graded. And if you're going to do that, get the highest grade you possibly can, which is going to be an MS69 and MS70 for more current coins, like the 2014 Philharmonic. If you can get an MS70, go get it. Uh, you might have a slightly different grading system in Europe, but in, in the States, it would be the MS grading system. Um, because if you get into the lower grades, you know, 64, 63, these more common coins, you're not really ahead of the game. You've just purchased a common collectible coin and, and the resale value on that coin is going to be the metal content. You're not going to get the, the premium that a collector would be willing to pay for. So that would be the advice that I would uh, put out to people. Fantastic. Mark, extremely insightful conversation. Really, really appreciate it. We need to get you back on because I'm curious like how premiums develop on the physical side because it seems like some investors are just getting fleeced out there with those premiums. If I see $40 or $39 silver eagles at a $24 spot price, then uh, uh, you know the, the little hairs on the back of my neck stand up. So I'm um, always curious to hear from you, Mark. I'd love to have you back on. Where can we find more of you? Hi, yeah, happy to be back on. First of all, love sharing knowledge with people and trying to help people save a few dollars on their precious metal investments. The hairs on the back of your neck should stand up when you see that. Absolutely. So if there's one takeaway from this whole interview is don't buy silver eagles. <laughs> um, but uh, no, we, you can find me on YouTube. We do a lot of videos to help educate people as well about precious metals. We do a series called Inside the Vault, which has been a huge success for helping investors. And obviously, if you want to learn about us, it's uh, swpcayman.com. You can learn all about what we do. Fantastic. Mark, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on SOAR Financially. And uh, we'll have you back on very, very soon. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. This was SOAR Financially. We hope you found the information uh, insightful because we rarely talk about bullion here on the channel, but it's an interesting aspect of investing. And I think everybody should own a bit of bullion in their portfolio as well, just as a diversification factor, in my opinion, as well. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. It's that little square box at the bottom down here, I think, somewhere. Or there's that little bird in the corner roughly right there. And uh, hit that subscribe button. We do appreciate it because 90% of you are not subscribed to the channel for whatever reason. And uh, it helps us bring fantastic guests on like Mark and others. So make sure to do that. And uh, we'll be back with lots, lots more content. Thank you so much for tuning in.